recording. Okay, so it's great pleasure to have the uh, Son Julie uh, from hopefully uh, from IBS. He's going to tell us about uh, quantum uh, gravity constraints and emergent strings, please. So thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to speak in this seminar series. Um, so, oops, sorry. Just, uh, Sorry. So yeah. Um, so today uh, I'd like to tell you about how some of the quantum gravity constraints are realized in string theory. And uh, in fact, the answer is already suggested in this title. So it's going to be due to emergent strings. So the talk will be based on uh, this series of uh, papers written in collaboration with Wolfgang Riehe and Guli Lockhart and CERN Timo Weigand and Daniel Klauer at DESI and uh, Max Wiesner at IFT. Um, let me begin by introducing the notion of quantum gravity constraints first. So at high energy, we have the quantum gravity, which for the purpose of this talk is string theory. And this is a very constrained theory, a point in the space of all possible uh, uh, theories. But by the time you flow down to uh, low energies, this unique theory gives rise to a vast set of string EFTs, the landscape. The idea was that the uh, string theory has lots of solutions as manifested by the multitude of possible internal geometries. And for each of these vacua, we have a different low energy physics. So, all theories in the landscape have a UV completion into quantum gravity uh, by construction. However, as it turns out, there are many apparently consistent low energy quantum field theories that cannot be completed into quantum gravity. And the set of such incomplete theories uh, is called the swampland. So within the space of all apparently consistent theories, there are theories in the landscape which can complete into string theory and uh, those in the swampland which cannot. This is a very sharp uh, subdivision of the theory space, but uh, it won't be too useful unless we can come up with uh, some practical criteria uh, by which theories in the landscape can be uh, distinguished from those in the swampland. Um, in this context, quantum gravity constraints is a, a general term that refers to any consistency constraints that quantum gravity imposes on general grounds. Then when we are given a low energy quantum field theory, we can test if it obeys those constraints. And if it fails any of them, then we put it into this one plane. And uh, determining what these quantum gravity constraints are is the goal of the Swampland program. Uh, before proceeding further, uh, I would like you to notice that the word believed is inserted up here. Uh, this is to emphasize that uh, 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 these constraints are actually conjectural constraints. So uh, 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 for this reason, they are often called quantum gravity conjectures. So while it's exciting for sure to explore interesting consequences of these constraints, uh, we must also make sure that the constraints are indeed valid. We may then apply them eventually to our universe to, to constrain the new physics effect, for instance. Um, the evidence comes largely in two types. Uh, the first type follows from uh, general quantum gravity phenomena, such as the black hole dynamics. Uh, the argument would work in every quantum gravity model described in whatever theoretical framework, uh, be string theory or not. But it's typically only heuristics. On the other hand, the second type is based on actual calculations for a given string effective field theory. 
The argument of this type is precise and quantitative, but it tends to be model dependent. What you do is to explicitly test the conjecture for a specific theory of your choice. Um, if you could perform at all the required hard computations for the particular theory. So this is a traditional flow. Uh, traditionally, a quantum gravity constraint originates from the, the former type evidence. And then once a, a promising conjecture appears in the literature, then string theories try to test it out to accumulate evidence. In this talk, um, I will address the letter type evidence, but in a manner that saves us from the disadvantage. Uh, it would not be convincing enough if a conjecture was proposed only because it was tested in a couple of string EFTs. On the other hand, uh, what we will do here is to address various conjectures for a whole class of string EFTs at one go. And along the way, we will propose a uh, universal microscopy origin of the conjectures. Right, and the hope is then to eventually develop novel quantum gravity intuition. Specifically, um, we will address four concrete conjectures and in particular their interconnections. Let me first say a few words about uh, each of them. Uh, the first is the uh, no global symmetry conjecture, uh, which indicates that the coupling G of a gauge uh, 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 interaction cannot become zero in presence of gravity. Uh, the second is the completeness conjecture, which says that the charge spectrum has to be complete in that every charge value is populated by a particle. The third is the so-called weak gravity conjecture, which claims uh, in its strong form that a, a lattice amount of charged particles must obey a certain charge to mass ratio bound where the lower bound mu is uh, uh, an order one constant in Planck unit. For future terminology, I will call any particles extremal uh, if uh, they saturate this bound uh, and super extremal if uh, the strict inequality works with them. Uh, last but not least is this distance conjecture. The claim is that if you deform the theory too much, then there must arise an infinite tower of light states of which mass scale is suppressed exponentially by the distance. Let me emphasize that all of this, except for the first one, predict uh, uh, a certain tower of particles, which is a very strong claim. Uh, now we will aim to see if and how these constraints are realized in, in string theory setup. For this purpose, uh, let's say we try to violate the first conjecture in a given string EFT and then see what happens. Specifically, by appropriately deforming the string geometry, we deform the effective physics in such a way that the gauge coupling does tend to zero while the Planck mass is kept fixed. This is what we will call a weak gauge coupling limit in this talk. Then in such a situation, we will be led to this miraculous observation that a light particle tower obeying all the specific criteria indeed arises. It turns out that at the core of this stringy realization is a, a beautiful geometric interplay between the dynamics of uh, different forces as well as the intriguing uh, physics of string dualities. Towards the end of the talk, we will hopefully have appreciated what's meant by this. <clears throat> In fact, the underlying string mechanism seems rather universal, uh, but uh, in this talk, to be concrete, I will start with uh, F-theory EFTs, and via the duality with heterotic theory, I will address the quantum gravity constraints in the weak gauge coupling limits. Uh, we have analyzed 60 and 40 situations, uh, both with uh, minimal supersymmetries. Of course, the ladder is much uh, 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 less controlled and accordingly much richer. And the main goal 
is to understand what happens in this more complicated uh, 4D setting. However, I find that comparison with the uh, 6D analog is uh, often very helpful. So uh, in various places of the talk, I will present the 60 counterpart stories in parallel uh, in a hope that this does not mess up the flow of the talk. Um, and this way, we will also be able to clarify some of the genuinely new features in four dimensions where we only have uh, four real supercharges. So that's the end of my long introduction uh, slash motivation. Let me now start making this story more precise by uh, uh, getting into some of the details. So here is the um, outline. Um, I will start by carefully setting up the arena. Uh, the main physical object in scrutiny will be solitonic strings uh, uh, in four-dimensional F theory. So I will first spend a few slides to remind you of some, um, some of the rudimentary facts of F theory before jumping into part one. In part one then, uh, I will address the connection between uh, elliptic genera of those strings and certain Gromov-Witten invariants, and will explain their modular behavior. Then I will illustrate all of this in an explicit model with a U1 vector. In part two, I will switch gears to finally uh, address the aforementioned quantum gravity uh, uh, constraints in four dimensions, and in particular, the weak gravity conjectures. Upon taking a weak gauge coupling limit, we will see that a certain special solitonic uh, uh, string necessarily becomes tensionless, uh, of which excitations will then bring about a tower of particles, uh, which in turn will satisfy the uh, weak gravity inequality. And for this uh, last step to work, it will be very crucial that the elliptic genus is a quasi-Jacobi form uh, uh, which will already uh, uh, have been explained in part one. So this is the rough plan. Uh, let's now begin. Uh, a capital D dimensional F theory is a type two B string theory on a complex small D fold BD uh, where we have a varying axial dilaton profile. Uh, for a quick notational remark, let me stress that the uh, uh, capital D is 10 minus two times the small d because the uh, small d here is a complex dimension. In fact, uh, in this talk, any subscripts for any manifolds uh, will always denote uh, complex dimensions. Uh, so now the dilaton profile can be specified by an elliptic vibration over uh, BD, um, of which total space is a Calabi-Yau D plus one fold Y. Uh, then the gauge fields arise from seven brains on a divisor B uh, uh, of BD, whose class we know how to compute in a given background. Another notational remark uh, to be made here is that the symbol B, uh, whether big or small, uh, or whether calligraphy or not later, uh, will be used in various different occasions. And I really hope that this will not confuse you, but uh, if it does, please um, ask me at any time. And I apologize in advance for this uh, bad notation, which I uh, should have fixed. <laughs> uh, so as already sketched in the introduction, we will be interested in understanding the interplay between the gravity and the gauge dynamics. So their couplings are determined respectively by the volume of the internal space BD and that of the gauge divisor B. As for the uh, gauge dynamics, the main focus of this talk will be on the U1 uh, in spirit of addressing weak gravity in part two in particular. But uh, let me still mention that most of our results uh, do apply to the non-abelian cases or to the multiple U1 cases as well. 
And note that the volumes are calculated with respect to a Kähler class J. So in studying the uh, geometric interplay of the force dynamics, the moduli space in question will be the um, Kähler moduli space of the base, which we will further discuss in part two. Uh, next, the uh, geometric origin of U1s in F theory uh, is the uh, non-zero sections S of the uh, elliptic vibration pi, in addition to the uh, uh, zero section S0. One can define a certain morphism in this context known as the Shioda map, which associates a section to a a device or class in the total space Y in such a way that these uh, are defining properties uh, are, are satisfied. Schematically, the map is given this way in terms of a certain pullback divisor, but you won't have to remember this uh, precise form of, of this map. Uh, note, by the way, that the, the circles appearing here uh, uh, denote the intersection uh, in the Calabria Y D plus one. Uh, to be clear, we will later use a, a different symbol, center dot for the intersection in the base. <clears throat> now to the physics of these sections, via the duality with M theory, uh, we can learn that a U1 vector arises from expanding C3 over sigma, and its inverse gauge coupling is easily computed uh, uh, in terms of the volume of a certain uh, a divisor B defined uh, in this precise manner. And uh, the name of this object in algebraic geometry is the height pairing divisor. Um, importantly, when non-trivial sections are present, there arises a fiber curve CF, which is homologically independent to the full elliptic fiber CE um, as, as, as shown here. And uh, these two curves uh, intersect with the uh, sections in this particular manner. So roughly speaking, the curve CF uh, is carrying a, a, a U1 charge. Now to the fluxes, um, supersymmetric fluxes uh, lie in H22 which you may decompose into the horizontal, the vertical, and the remainder parts. To study gauge fluxes, we consider the vertical fluxes, i.e. products of one one forms. Then the genus zero Gromov-Witten invariants are computable by a mirror symmetry for four folds, under which the horizontal and the vertical fluxes are exchanged. Now, four-dimensional Lorentz invariants uh, requires the fluxes to obey these uh, transversality conditions. They turn out to give a certain subspace uh, of H2 to vert uh, spent by these uh, classes. Recall that sigma here is the showdown map image of this section, and the alphas here are the uh, basis one one forms on the uh, base B3. This subspace uh, is often denoted by uh, the subscript minus one for some reason I may uh, or may not get to uh, uh, later, depending on time. Uh, in fact, uh, every vertical flux decomposes into these uh, three sectors. However, in our study of four dimensional Lorentz invariant F theory, uh, we will restrict to these transversal U1 fluxes or uh, minus one fluxes. And uh, in the rest of this talk, we will not consider fluxes of the other types. So uh, in the current setup, the uh, base divisor B, when wrapped by D7 brain, leads to a four-dimensional gauge multiplet. Similarly, a base curve uh, CB, when wrapped by D3 brain, leads to a four-dimensional effective string. And, and this guy is going to be the key player in our game. Uh, here, the subscript B in CB is for, for base and is not at all an index. So please don't get confused. <clears throat> now, the Warshi theory of such a solitonic string 
is obtained by reducing the D3 brain dynamics along CB and turns out to have zero to supersymmetries. Furthermore, if CB intersects the gauge divisor B, then uh, three seven modes are present uh, charged under the four dimensional gauge group. Then at the end of the day, the topology of CB uh, embedded inside the base B3 is going to tell us about the type of the resulting streams. Uh, in fact, for reasons that will become clearer in part two, we will assume that the base threefold admits a rational vibration over its own twofold base B2, uh, uh, as depicted in here. Uh, the projection map for this rational vibration will be denoted as uh, P, and its rational fiber will be denoted as C0. Then, obviously, the normal bundle of this fiber class C0 is going to be trivial, and uh, the topological configuration uh, in the end identifies the associated string as the four dimensional heterotic string. In this geometric setup, uh, the rational fibers may degenerate uh, non genericly. Um, for example, if the C0 splits into a, uh, a pair of rational curves, each with normal bundle. Uh, o minus one plus O, then uh, the pair of associated strings exhibit an interesting feature, uh, 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 which is analogous to six dimensional E strings. And we may call them four dimensional E strings. In this talk, I will often restrict to the special case where CB is in fact taken uh, to be the rational fiber C0. This way we will be able to directly apply uh, uh, all the results of part one to the precise setup of part two later. However, uh, many of the general features, which will be illustrated mainly with uh, such a heterotic string, are also going to be shared by non critical strings. Oops, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so um, that was the uh, arena. And uh, let me finally start part one. I will first discuss elliptic genera, and then we'll explain their connection to the uh, gromov witten theory. <clears throat> um, the elliptic genus of a 0, 0,2 string is defined as an index uh, like this, where the fugacity parameters Q and C are distinguishing the states with uh, different energy levels and uh, different U1 charges. Um, one of the basic properties of such an elliptic genus is that uh, it only gets contributions from the sector with HR equals zero. In the heterotic case, however, um, non-trivial terms in Z can be level matched by uh, right movers, resulting in physical particle excitations of the four-dimensional string. Therefore, heterotic elliptic genus will provide a certain information about the EFT spectrum which will play a, a very crucial role uh, later in part two, but that will, that will be uh, uh, for later. Let me add a couple more important properties related to our current F theory geometry. Firstly, uh, expansion coefficients of a four dimensional elliptic genus are interpretable as certain gromov witten invariants on the uh, elliptic total space Y4 and secondly, a well-defined behavior is expected under modular slash elliptic transformations, uh, at least naively. So what exactly do I mean by these properties and uh, where, where do they come, come from? <clears throat> uh, before describing the 4D physics, let me uh, first review the six dimensional situation, which is uh, uh, much more extensively discussed in the literature. So we consider a six dimensional F theory on S1 and also the solitonic string associated with a given base curve CB. The string once wrapped on the circle with winding one and momentum N uh, corresponds in the four di five dimensional FM theory to the uh, M2 brain wrapped on CB plus uh, N times the full fiber. Then the duality tells us that the elliptic genus of this six dimensional string 
encodes the BPS invariant uh, 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 for these M2 brain particles. Uh, to be more precise, uh, we consider a U1 refined elliptic genus, which we expand in two figurative parameters, Q and C. And I denote this object as ZY3CB uh, by specifying the uh, elliptic Calabi Yao and the type of the string uh, in terms of the curve class. Then the uh, expansion coefficients, uh, these ends, uh, are the uh, uh, Gromov-Witten invariants on Y3. For the curves C sub N R, uh, which are CB plus N times the full elliptic fiber CE plus R times uh, another fiber curve class CF uh, carrying a U1 charge as defined earlier. And the figures of these tau and Z are the volumes of CE and CF on the M theory side. Uh, note that there is a shift uh, by the zero point energy given in terms of this topological intersection where K bar denotes the anti-canonical class of the base P2. So uh, in the end, up to an overall shift, the generating function uh, a curly FCB of these enumerative invariants is going to be uh, identified with the elliptic genus uh, curly ZCB of the, so to speak, uh, CB string. And furthermore, uh, famously, the FCB is computable via the good old mirror symmetry techniques for three folds. Now uh, we turn to uh, four dimensions. Uh, by analogy, we propose that the elliptic genus of a four dimensional CB string has its expansion coefficients end uh, given again by uh, these enumerative invariants. Uh, the precise mathematical description in this case is that they are the uh, genus zero invariant on the uh, 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 elliptic fourfold Y4 for the uh, one pointed fixed curves C sub NR, where the G4 flux is inserted. Uh, now, the generating function F is defined uh, with respect to a, a curve class CB, uh, as well as to a chosen uh, flux, uh, four form uh, flux class G. Uh, once again, this object is then computable by a mirror symmetry and is identified with the elliptic genus up to uh, the, the same zero point shift as in 60. So can I ask you a question? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yes, it's just a small question. So what's the interpretation of the strings in 40? What's the interpretation? Interpretation of strings. Like, for example, in 60, it's, yes. it's the source for the self dual two forms of the tensor multiplet. Right. So it's like effective string, but in 40, uh, like the easy charge under some two forms. Or... Sure, it's, it's it's a string, so it is it is it is it is a so so it, it is indeed yeah the same it is the same here. Yeah, but uh, so, so there, are, of, there are there right. are there are there are axioms in four D, of which there is a two form field, and of course these strings are, are, are precisely related to these two forms. You mean the axioms? Yeah. So the dual uh -huh. of the axiom in four D is two forms, uh, unlike in sixty where the dual of the two forms are. Uh, uh, is again two forms, but now it's axion with two forms. So these are precisely the objects. In okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, where was I? Okay. So, okay. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I didn't mean to actually go over this uh, uh, math uh, math remarks. So let me just now uh, uh, discuss modularity. Uh, again, firstly, in six dimensions, uh, the elliptic genus is well known to be a, a Jacobi form modulo quasi-modular quasi uh, E2s. Uh, recall here that a Jacobi form exhibits these defining behaviors uh, under the SL2Z transformations and under the elliptic transformations. And the two integers W and M uh, appearing here and there, uh, 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 these guys are what is known as the weight and 
the index, uh, uh, respectively. Uh, recall also that the ring of Jacobi forms is finitely generated. Uh, the generators here are the Eigenstein series E4 and E6 with weights 4 and 6, uh, as well as certain uh, uh, Jacobi forms with indicated weights and indices. Uh, this fact is going to be used later in, in analyzing explicit examples, but uh, uh, this will not be uh, crucial in developing a general story. Now, it is expected on general grounds that the elliptic genus has a well-defined weight and index. Uh, here, the expected modular weight is given this way for a string in capital D dimensions, which for D equals 6 is then minus 2. Similarly, for the elliptic index, uh, uh, the Toft anomaly consideration leads to this uh, uh, particular formula for the elliptic index in terms of the intersection of the gauge divisor B with the base curve CB. Uh, and finally, E2s are expected to appear when CB can split. In the hydrodic case, for example, the uh, base curve CB is the rational fiber C0, which splits on a blob locus into a pair of E string curves. And in such a situation, the hydrodic elliptic genus does involve E2s famously. Then the elliptic genus is not modular in a strict sense, but uh, the only modification in practice is going to be that the, the generating set has to be endowed with a single extra object E2. For 60 strings, all of this uh, modular behavior has been uh, very firmly established, resulting in lots of intriguing applications. However, uh, much less uh, has been explored in four dimensions. Part of the reason being that the uh, for the elliptic genus is not Jacobi in general, not even mod modular E2s. So it's uh, going to be much, much more uh, difficult to control. But we still have a specific expectation for the weight and uh, uh, index. The weight is expected to be minus one and the index again given by this intersection formula. Recall that even in six dimensions, the elliptic genus was not Jacobi in a most strict sense but we could still control it by including E2s in the generating set. In four dimensions, however, um, as it turns out, it's not enough to just include E2s and uh, something uh, very different uh, is going to happen. And our proposal is that the general ansatz in the four dimensional sector must involve a derivative sector, completely breaking Jacobinus. So we propose that the elliptic genus decompose into these two sectors, the Z sub minus one and the C derivative of Z sub minus two. Here, these two Zs are individually Jacobi forms, again, modulo uh, E2s in general. And uh, in fact, we can say more about the specific forms of these two uh, Jacobi objects. They take the form of this ratio where the numerator uh, is uh, uh, a, a holomorphic Jacobi form and the denominator ansatz is provided by the pole structure. Importantly, the denominators for a given weight index pair have only a finite set of uh, undetermined parameters because the ring of holomorphic Jacobi forms uh, as addressed is finitely generated. Therefore, uh, once enough expansion coefficients are obtained, we can immediately complete them into a Jacobi object. And indeed, given an explicit uh, compactification background, we can compute uh, enough low degree invariants by a mirror symmetry, and they are the input data with which the numerator ansatz can be solved. This way, we can obtain a, a complete closed form expression for the elliptic genus. Uh, all of this will shortly be illustrated uh, in an explicit example. But before we get there, let me say a few words about the, the origin of this derivative ansatz. So once again, we suppose that the base threefold B3 is rationally fibered over a certain uh, twofold B2 and denote uh, by P the uh, projection map. 
Um, to be concrete, we will assume that B3 is a blow up of a non-degenerate vibration um, along a, uh, a single curve inside B2, but the arguments will easily generalize. So um, over this blue uh, blow up locus uh, uh, within B2, uh, the, the, the fiber C0 will split into C1 plus C2 and uh, the vibration of C2s over this blow up locus uh, in the base is going to be the blow up divisor uh, denoted by E. And I will denote by S minus the, uh, the section of the rational vibration P. Also, uh, in the rest of this talk, the base curve CB will be fixed to C0 for our study of heterodic elliptic genus. Now let's say we are given an explicit U1 model over a, um, uh, a threefold base of this form. Uh, this means that a concrete elliptic vibration is specified and also that uh, a, a Lorentz invariant flux is chosen. Uh, as I reviewed in the introduction, the flux is a linear combination of uh, 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 these basis fluxes. Uh, here, the sigma is once again the Shioda image of the section, and the d alphas are basis divisors of uh, B3. Uh, in this current setting, d alphas can be um, either the section uh, S minus, uh, the blow up divisor E, or the, the pullback divisors with gamma i's here uh, denoting the, the base divisors of. Uh, B2. <clears throat> so let me now spell out the, the geometric origin of our proposal, and in particular, uh, 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 that of the derivative sector. Uh, the objects to study are these uh, uh, invariants on Y4 for the curve classes uh, C and R uh, with respect to the basis fluxes and then we can linearly combine them. And in fact, uh, the current slide is going to be the most technical one in this talk. So uh, in case you were already happy to accept uh, our proposal about the derivative sector, then you might just want to uh, relax for the next three or four minutes. If not, uh, uh, please keep focusing. I will be trying to sketch the logic uh, as briefly as possible. <clears throat> So we will be considering two types of fluxes in turn, which uh, once combined uh, will span the entire flux space. Let's start with the second type defined by imposing uh, these linear constraints. Uh, I've denoted such a flux as GQM uh, uh, because it's dubbed as uh, a quasi-modular flux for some reason. Anyways, uh, for such a special type of fluxes, uh, it was argued uh, uh, in this paper that the elliptic genus is in fact a genuine Jacobi form of the expected weight and index. But the major anomaly arises for the other type flux, the first type, which is defined by taking the d alphas to be uh, 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 the pullback devices, uh, p star gamma i's, for each divisor of B2 uh, gamma i. Then uh, because P star gamma i is a C0 vibration itself, uh, the fourfold invariant, which we want to compute uh, is going to be uh, uh, reduced to this uh, threefold invariant where this threefold Y3i is the induced elliptic vibration on P star gamma i. So the, it's the, the elliptic vibration is induced by pulling it back under this pi. <clears throat> uh, then applying the so-called divisor equation in the Gromov-Witten theory, uh, uh, we can pull out this sigma insertion and turn that into this prefactor. And this prefactor uh, evaluates to R because the uh, uh, fibral curve CF uh, uh, was carrying a unit charge. Then, uh, thanks to this prefactor R, uh, this derivative relation 
uh, uh, immediately arises once we sum the, the invariants here and here um, over n and r with appropriate uh, figure study parameters inserted. Uh, and finally, uh, combining what we've learned about these two uh, flux types, we therefore arrive at the general ansatz of the proposed form. Uh, in fact, according to the uh, mathematical conjecture by Oberdeck and Pixton uh, four years ago, uh, the four-dimensional elliptic genus must exhibit the so-called uh, quasi-Jacobi property. And uh, the derivative structure we propose here manifests this quasi-Jacobi nature. However, for the sake of time, let me not delve into this uh, quasi-Jacobi uh, perspective today. Uh, probably it's best to skip that. Um, okay. <clears throat> So uh, uh, instead, I will be uh, making all of this abstract discussion so far uh, more concrete by illustrating how it works in an explicit fourfold ex example. <clears throat> uh, right. So the, the, the threefold base of our choice is going to be dp2 times p1l. Uh, the base geometry will involve several p1s and uh, for a, a clear distinction, I put this subscript L for this P1 factor. So what are the other P1s? Uh, we may view the uh, uh, Del Pezzo surface D DP2 as uh, uh, a one-point blow-up of the Hertzburg surface F1. And this guy is a vibration of rational curves uh, P1F over another rational curve P1H. So we have these three different rational curves, P1F, P1H, and uh, P1L. And we will take the P1F as the C0 of the uh, rational vibration P, uh, 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 of which twofold base will then be this uh, P1H times P1L. Uh, the one one cohomology of this twofold base P2 is then spent by the two P1 factors, P1H and P1L. And uh, the cohomology of B3 is going to be spent by the two pullback divisors um, and the, the section S minus and the blow up divisor E. In fact, we may take any uh, a full combination thereof as long as they spend the full cohomology. <clears throat> uh, as for the elliptic fiber, we use this particular elliptic curve of which ambient twofold has this specific GLSM description. The reason is because this way we will obtain a rank one amount of sections leading in turn to a single U1 vector in the EFT. Uh, specifically, we take a hypersurface of this form where the coefficients are sections of appropriate line bundles are defined this way on B3. And you can see that there is one unfixed class beta round. And uh, for this model, we take it as two times k bar. Uh, and with this choice, the U1 gate divider is computed as two times k bar as well. Uh, the final ingredient to be specified is the flux. The base geometry leads to four basis fluxes. And their linear combination will describe a most general flux. So these small c's are the four flux parameters. Now, given that both the B3 and the vibration admit a GLSM description, we can apply the mirror symmetry techniques to compute the low degree Gromov-Witten invariant. And this is a result up to uh, second order in Q. Uh, next, we restrict to these two uh, uh, threefold Y3i's both of which uh, in this particular example turned out to be uh, a, a Calabria threefold. Then we can similarly obtain the uh, threefold invariant again by mirror symmetry. We will then view all of these expansions as the uh, first few sectors of the heterotic elliptic genera in four dimensions and in six dimensions. Uh, remarkably, uh, we find that the uh, 4D elliptic genus can reorganize uh, in this manner where uh, Z0, 1, and 2 have these closed form expressions. Furthermore, the letter 2 objects uh, appearing in this derivative sector 
are precisely uh, these uh, 60 elliptic genera on these two threefold Y3 eyes. Now, apparently, all of this conforms with the uh, proposed general structure. Sorry, can I ask you another question? Oh, yes, please. <clears throat> yes, I'm slightly confused. So, because in general, when you consider the Calabria fourfold, mm -hmm. the gravity invariance, actually, people only consider genus zero and genus one gravity invariance. That's true, that's true. So, I guess here you are, it's not just a function function, you have some insertion in the. So, sorry. The you have some insertion of operators so yeah. that you can have. So, I mean, if you can visit the, the genus, if you expand, you have all genus uh, covariant invariance. Yeah, right. so here I'm only looking at the uh, genus zero part, uh, as in 60. As in 60. Yeah, so also in 60, I was only looking at the genus zero part of the covariant invariance. And here I'm also doing the same thing. Although in 40, we can even write down the complete thing because there are right. only zero, zero and one invariant. But here I'm only focusing on the zero, zero part. So you mean that uh, the Lipid genus, when you expand, I, I, I suppose that you have uh, you have all genus expression for a given degree, given base degree. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. True. But you say that. But you say that. Uh, yeah, I'm just the leading off right. the, the 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 leading part. Yes. Um, I see. Okay. Okay. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yep, thanks. Okay, so yeah, that's the end of part one. And how am I doing with the time? Uh, okay, let's see. So uh, having focused entirely so far on the worship physics, uh, now we will be quickly switching gears to eventually discuss the uh, space-time EFT physics. In particular, we will address how the weak gravity conjectures are realized along with a few other conjectures. So as sketched in the introduction, what we will do is to take a weak gauge coupling limit and then to see what happens to the effective field theory. Uh, and the claim is that an emergent tensionless string necessarily arises in such a limit. Uh, let me explain this firstly in six dimensions. Uh, the key geometric statement is this, uh, uh, this uh, paragraph. Uh, in the uh, limit of our interest, where the U1 gauge divisor B uh, expands inside the twofold base B2, while this uh, base itself is kept finite. One can always find a shrinking base curve C0 inside B2. And furthermore, uh, this shrinking curve intersects this, uh, uh, inter uh, this expanding divisor B. It does not self-intersect and it's topologically a two-sphere. And in fact, one may also argue for its uniqueness. So what's the consequence in physics of this uh, geometrical statement? Can so I ask you a question? Oh, yes. Yeah, so here you are assuming that the base two to be the Hertzberg surface or P2? No. Or any, any kind of? Any, yeah, any kind of base P2. Uh, as long as it admits a weak coupling limit. So for example, NK surface, you can use the uh, NK, I'm not considering NK here. Uh, NK is very special, but, but I'm considering, for example, P2 is also excluded here. So what I'm, what I'm interested in is to study the regime in the moduli space where the gauge coupling is weak, uh, as uh -huh. I defined in the introduction. And as long as you can build a model of such a weakly coupled U1, uh, uh, together with gravity, then the uh, argument works. And so there are only a handful of exceptions to this uh, existence of such a weak coupling limit. Okay, so apart from Hertzberg surface, do you have any such example? Any blow ups there, any blow ups. So, yeah, yeah, the, blow up. With, so, uh, so, I mean, yeah, the Hertzberg sure. surface would be the blow. Other than that surface, do you have other example having such a U1 weakly coupled gauge theory description in your argument? Sure. So, uh, so, okay. So let me let me specify what I mean by this. So, mm -hmm. uh, you start from whatever base B two, and you impose that this geometry mm -hmm. admits a weak coupling limit. This mm -hmm. then imposes to the geometry that it is rationally fibered. That's why mm -hmm. I was focusing only on rationally fibered B twos. Mm -hmm. So okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so now, uh, uh, uh. If you 
by this geometric statement under this uh, 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 under this well constraint or uh, at least in this asymptotic regime of the moduli space, then uh, upon wrapping the C0 with a D3 brain and dimensionally reducing the brain dynamics, we end up getting a solitonic heterotic string in six dimensions because uh, uh, C0 is a genus zero curve with a trivial Norman bundle. Uh, in fact, the string becomes tensionless in the limit, uh, which according to the Heterotic F3 duality also implies that the string is weakly coupled. And it carries a U1 charge because B is the gauge divisor. And furthermore, the geometric uniqueness statement here uh, leads to the important uniqueness of the heterotic string. And this is very assuring. So firstly, why should such a shrinking C0 uh, uh, exist at all? Uh, instead of boring you, yeah. Do yeah, you have so here you are. You are saying that in such a coupling limit, you always, so starting from the topography in six dimensions, uh, if you take such a coupling limit, then you will always end up with the uh, 60 heterotic string. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, okay. In the F3 context, yeah, that's right. Thank you. So, yeah, sure. So, I, I'm not going to, uh, so I'm showing you this slide for too long, but I'm not going to bother you with the uh, tedious details written here. Uh, let me just uh, quickly go through the key ideas. The uh, major task here is to characterize the form of the, the Kähler class in an, uh, in an arbitrary weak gauge coupling limit. And the Kähler class in the limit turns out to involve precisely one large Kähler parameter T uh, associated with some Kähler congenerator, uh, which I denote as J0 here. Then necessarily J0 must square to zero because otherwise the volume of V2 will diverge. Then in step two, jumping to step two, the shrinking heterotic curve C0 is identified with uh, 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 this J0. In particular, we can show that the volume of uh, such a curve C0 uh, converges to one over T, where T is this large Keller parameter uh, characterizing this uh, weak gauge coupling limit. Furthermore, C0 dot B is easily shown to be positive and even so a positive integer m can be defined in this way. Uh, I also brought our uniqueness argument. Uh, uh, it turns out to follow very easily from the high school mathematics of a cauchy short type uh, inequality. But let me, let me just skip over all of this algebra for the sake of time. And uh, now uh, let's go into four dimensions. So we still have a similar geometric result, which is spiritually uh, very much the same as the 61. And this is the Wadi summary. Uh, in the Sorry. weak. Uh, Can I ask one more question? Yes, please, please. So uh, you are in the heterotic string in such a recoupling limit. Do you have an infinite power there? Yeah, that's so we switch to heterotic jewelry frame in order to see the infinite power. So we start from F theory. There is uh -huh. no heterotic theory. Uh -huh. But in this regime, we have to switch to the heterotic jewelry frame. That's the claim. Okay, then what is the infinite power in heterotic? Yeah, frame? let me let me go into that in the in the in the last part of the talk. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to make it short, it's the heterotic excitations, but I'll, I will explain that. Okay, thank you. Sure. I mean, if you want to have more time, you, you can have a, like a like a ten more minutes or Ooh. so. Go ahead. Okay, I mean, if that's okay, if you, I mean, yeah. Okay, if you maybe, have more slides, yeah. Oh yeah, I actually have another section, but. I may, okay, I may spend maybe five more minutes if, if that's okay. Uh, no, I mean, we have flexible time anyway. Yeah, five to Go 10, ahead. I will, I will yeah. imagine extra five more. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, right. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, read this uh, uh, sentence once again, uh, in, uh, uh, which will be applied in four dimensions. It's essentially the same as in uh, six dimensions, but let me just read it for you. So in the uh, weak gauge coupling limit, uh, uh, there exists a unique uh, genus zero curve C0 shrinking at a fastest rate with a trivial Noma bundle. So I just read what I wrote here. Uh, and unlike in six dimensions, the uniqueness argument in four dimensions is only going to be uh, 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 working for a fastest shrinking curve. But 
if you think about it, that's all we need for a, oops, does it work? Yeah, for a, a well-defined a, a heterotic duality frame. Because uh, param you, you are only considering parametrically uh, a small extension uh, uh, and, and, and that's guaranteed. The uniqueness of that such, such a string is guaranteed by this uh, uh, sort of uh, weakened uh, uniqueness uh, 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 criterion. <clears throat> so uh, in fact, a major new feature in four dimensions uh, compared to six dimensions is that uh, a weak gauge coupling could be achieved in uh, two very different types of geometric limits. So uh, in six dimensions, uh, as I very briefly sketched, the Keller class uh, in the limit had to involve a very large parameter T. And there was this associated Keller congenerator J0, uh, which had to square to zero in order to keep the size of V2 finite. Similarly, in four dimensions, we still have such a generator J0 associated with the large parameter T, but now this cubes to zero because the base is a threefold. Then there are two possibilities that can be very, very different. Uh, 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 so J0 square can be zero or it can be non-zero. Uh, and depending on uh, uh, whether J0 square vanishes or not, the precise geometry behaves uh, indeed very differently. Nevertheless, one can uh, in the end prove very carefully that this key property uh, 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 in fact holds in both cases. And that's all I wanted to say about the uh, geometry of the uh, uh, physics of the weak gauge coupling limits. So yeah, now uh, as Hicho was asking, uh, what can we say about the uh, quantum gravity constraint and in particular about the uh, super extremal particles um, as predicted by the weak gravity? So again, let's start with the 60 situation. Uh, firstly, uh, having characterized the weak gauge coupling limits in the moduli space, uh, we can now compute the moduli space distance uh, D uh, uh, to the limiting regime. The result of this exercise is that the distance t behaves as log of 2t, where t, once again, was the large parameter that ap appeared in the Keller expansion. And this indeed goes to infinity in the limit. Uh, secondly, uh, with a, a limit sitting indeed at infinity, the distance conjecture predicts an infinite tower of light states. Indeed, a d3 brain on the shrinking curve C0 leads to an asymptotically tensionless heterotic string. And its quantization gives a light particle tower. Specifically, uh, the string tension is proportional to the volume of this curve C0, which if you recall the geometric claim is uh, precisely one over T uh, in the limit. And this uh, in terms of the distance uh, is e to the minus D. And therefore, the mass scale of the tower is exponentially suppressed as predicted. In fact, much more information can be extracted about this tower uh, by uh, carefully analyzing the heterotic elliptic genus. Uh, this is because non-trivial terms uh, in the elliptic genus will indicate the presence of excitations with the associated uh, mode number and U1 charge. So let me illustrate this with an explicit UR model on the twofold base now, uh, DP1. The way this model is constructed can be found in the paper. And here I will only just report on the results of our analysis. Firstly, uh, the topology of the model gives the elliptic index uh, M equals two of the heterody elliptic genus. Secondly, the expansion coefficients in the uh, first few Q sectors can be calculated uh, by mirror symmetry. And uh, this results in these numbers. Uh, the starting uh, coefficient as you see here is minus two. This is for tachyon, which cannot be level matched, but all the other terms present in this expansion uh, will lead to physical states. Then uh, thanks to the general ansatz for uh, now for 60 heterodic elliptic genus, 
our final task is to determine the holomorphic Jacobi form of weight minus two and index two, for which we only need to fix four parameters. For this purpose, it turns out that the set of invariants already computed here is more than enough, and uh, we thereby uh, fix these parameters and obtain this closed form expression. Uh, in the current context, what we will care is then the charge range at a given mode number. For instance, at n equals one, uh, uh, we have uh, states with charges zero, one, and two. And at n equals two, uh, the charge values are uh, runs from zero to uh, four, and so on and so forth. And with this closed form expression uh, uh, available, of course, we can very easily expand it to uh, whatever higher orders in Q uh, to extract the corresponding charge ranges. And uh, uh, here is the outcome of this exercise. Let me first clarify what the two axes represent. Uh, the horizontal axis is for the mode number N and the vertical axis is for uh, the maximal U1 charge Q max that appears in the, in the corresponding subsector of the spectrum. For instance, at mode numbers n equals one and two, uh, the blue dots are located at q max equals two and four here. Uh, these two values we have explicitly checked together in the uh, previous slide. And similarly, the q max values for higher ends are, uh, are very easily extracted from the expansion of the uh, uh, closed form heterotic elliptic Jones formula. And this plus summarizes the result up to n equals 40 or so. Importantly, in our weak gauge coupling limit, all the states indicated uh, by the elliptic genus arise from the quantization of our weakly coupled perturbative heterotic string, and therefore uh, their squared masses are proportional to n minus one. So these dots uh, in fact show the uh, Q max at a given mass square. Now, what are the two curves then? Um, firstly, the uh, solid blue curve passes through the origin and defines a uh, unique charge to mass ratio. And this unique charge, charge to mass ratio will be our reference ratio value for the extremality. Therefore, any dots sitting strictly above this uh, blue curve will be indicating the presence of super extremal states with the corresponding uh, mass and charge values. Notably, there are quite some few super extremal dots and uh, a subset of them are in fact sitting precisely on this uh, red dashed curve. And I'm going to color them uh, in red. Uh, then very interestingly, uh, we observe that these red dots populate any charges that are multiples of four. And this is not a coincidence. Uh, because the elliptic genus is a Jacobi form, the so-called theta expansion property guarantees that every charge value on the sublattice of index 2m must be populated by a dot sitting on the red curve. In particular, such a dot sits strictly above the blue curve and as such indicates a super extremal particle. And this uh, leads us to the confirmation of the other uh, conjectures. The completeness immediately follows from the expansion of the elliptic genus. And the weak gravity has also been confirmed in a sense already. What we've seen is the following. Uh, at every charge value on this sublattice of index 2m, well, as illustrated already in the example, we have states sitting on the red curve at the corresponding mode numbers. Then if you carefully keep track of all the numerical factors, uh, we conclude that the charge and the mass of these sublattice states obey uh, this equation. In particular, uh, this inequality of the conjectural form is obeyed. And here uh, uh, we have the model independent uh, lower bound mu equals one, which is the reference value coming from the blue curve. So for all of this to work out, what turns out to be very crucial in geometry is this relation uh, uh, in the limit amongst the volumes. 
of the three objects, the header of the curve, the U1 divisor, and the internal space. Uh, we could indeed confirm that this geometric relation holds in all weak gauge coupling limits of an arbitrary 60 F theory. So that's the claim. Uh, so what about uh, in four dimensions then? Uh, having detailed the arguments in 60, I will just give a very brief uh, two slide summary of how it works in four dimensions and then uh, uh, let me conclude the talk. So uh, recall that for special fluxes of a quasi-modular type, the heterodigalectic genus, even in four dimensions, was a genuine Jacobi form. And therefore, the theta expansion still guarantees the weak gravity tower, uh, just as in six dimensions. Now for uh, general fluxes, we've had uh, two lessons uh, uh, from part one. Uh, one is that the elliptic genus is uh, generically not Jacobi, which was really bad. However, the other lesson was that we can control its deviation from the Jacobins. Our proposal was that the elliptic genus is a sum of uh, a genuine Jacobi form of wave minus one and a C derivative of another Jacobi form of wave minus two. You might think that the derivative sector might ruin the argument for a super extremal sub lattice, but uh, as it turns out, it's all fine. The reason is the following. Firstly, the weight minus two object by itself does have a super extremal terms by the Jacobi property. And this was precisely the sixth reasoning. Next, the, the role of C derivative here is uh, just to multiply uh, each non-trivial term in this Z minus two uh, by the charge R. Then obviously uh, any charge the super extremal terms must remain even after the derivative and therefore the sublattice version of weak gravity should still hold. Uh, now, this is the final slide. I guess I can uh, still have two more minutes. Uh, so just very quickly, uh, uh, let me flash through uh, three genuinely new features uh, uh, of the 4D physics. Uh, firstly, unlike in six dimensions, the 4D F theory in general suffers from quantum corrections. In other words, any classical geometric results uh, have a danger of being corrected. Uh, for a similar reason to the 60 situation, uh, what's required for weak gravity in 4D is uh, this uh, volume relation in the weak gauge coupling. And uh, we have indeed confirmed this at the classical level in full generality, which is already a non-trivial result. But then what we have confirmed next is that this classical relation survives the corrections, which is an even more uh, uh, non-trivial fact. Uh, secondly, uh, in 4D, the U1s are generically Stuckelberg massive. So what we've shown generically is in fact that the, the weak gravity works for Stuckelberg U1s. However, uh, I have to uh, 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 point out that for the special quasi-modular fluxes, the mass turns out to uh, vanish effectively in the weak gauge coupling. So our logic does cover long range forces as well. And finally, uh, in 4D F3, uh, a U1 may arise not only from non-trivial sections, but also from uh, breaking a non-abelian algebra by uh, fluxes. However, even for the U1s of this very different origin, the weak gravity can still be explained in, in much the same way, except that we now have to speak of violin variant uh, forms. So uh, to conclude now, <coughs> Uh, we've studied elliptic genera of uh, zero to strings in, in four the EFTs of F theory. They are obtainable from the internal geometry via Gromov-Witten invariants, and their modular slash elliptic behavior is characterized by this decomposition uh, involving a, a derivative sector. Uh, using this worksheet result, uh, we have then analyzed the EFT spectrum to see how some of the quantum gravity conjectures, and in particular, the weak gravity conjectures are, are microscopically realized. Uh, the responsible string mechanism seems universal. To say the least, it works in every weak gauge coupling limit of a general four-dimensional F3 vacuum. And as for the weak gravity, the modular behavior of the heterodic elliptic genus uh, was crucial. So that's where I wanted to end. Uh, uh, 
Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Mm -hmm. um. Okay, so if there is no question, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Um, I will leave the space, uh, switch off the recording, leave the space for informal discussion. So if you want to ask more questions, just you can ask him.